Hello again and welcome back to English Today. This is DVD 20 and the third DVD of your advanced level. And in this DVD, we'll start with another two episodes of our story, That's Life. And then in our special TV programs, there'll be a discussion about how to manage change, known as change management. Then we'll move on to cinema and take a closer look at Star Wars. Then, in the grammar section, we'll look at ways of expressing your opinions in English. Then we'll study the construction used to, which we use when we're talking about habits. All right, so have fun. away. That's enough. There's a limit to everything, you know. Great. That's it, Anne. Go on like that. You are fantastic. Oh, fantastic, my eye. I told you to cut it out. Alice? Alice? Oh, yes, Anne. What can I do for you? <laughs> Stop laughing oh, Anne. <laughs> and tell your director friend to, to give it a rest oh. and put away that damn video camera. I absolutely do not want to be filmed like this. Have I made myself perfectly clear? <laughs> Hi, Alice. Hey. Good morning, Edward. Can't stop working, eh? <laughs> What's on the menu for today's shoot? <laughs> wow, Anne, you look beautiful. <laughs> Excuse me, um, could I use the bathroom for a moment? Huh? Thanks. Oh, calm down, Anne. None of these sessions are going to be shown for air. At least for now. What exactly does for now mean? Well, once all the material has been put in place, cut and edited, Edward's planning on showing it to a producer. If it's accepted, the idea is to go for our own TV program. <gasps> Isn't that a great idea? What? Yeah. Producer? Television? Mm-hmm. Let me in, Jack. Let me in. No, let me in. Oh. 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 Let me in. Oh. So, Anne, what do you think of Edward? In what sense? As a man or as a director? Do you really have to ask? As a man, of course. Well, I've just met him, so I can't really say. But um, as a director, my view is that he's a bit too intrusive. Come on, Anne, get over it. That's his job. In my opinion, I think he's just great. Oh, what's this I'm hearing? Our little Alice might be in love? Well, yes. As I see it, Anne, this is the first time in my life I've fallen head over heels in love. So much in love. But he doesn't even notice me. You know, we share so many common interests and we see things in the same way. We can talk for hours on end, but it just ends there. He looks on me as a good friend. Nothing more, nothing less. You know, I'm really not used to that role. Usually I'm the one to keep others at bay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I remember. Um, Tom, Frank, David... How many broken hearts have you left behind? 
So tell me, have you asked Edward how he feels about you? No, of course not. Look, Edward isn't interested in some relationship. He's, he's profound and introspective, spiritual. He's a person who enjoys observing and analysing others. Mm, yes, if you ask me, too much so. Anyway, I can't agree with you, I'm afraid. Even spiritual beings, personal longings. I think you should tell him. And who knows? Your Edward might be much more human than you think. Oh, maybe you're right. But... I have to think of a special way to show him just how I feel. Maybe I should see what my horoscope has to say. Hmm. Yes, 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 I've just had a brilliant idea. Hello again and welcome back to your live English language TV program. Did you hear in that episode how the girls were talking about their love problems? They were exchanging opinions about their love problems. Well, that's what I want to study with you now is how do you express your opinion in English and how do you ask other people for their opinion? Now, to do this, I want to talk about an article which I read um, yesterday, in fact, in this magazine about women. And the article made some statements, and I want to ask you what your opinion is about the statements that I read, and I will tell you mine, all right? Well, I read this. Women are less rational than men. Women are less rational than men. What do you think about that? Hmm? Yeah, well, I can go along with that. I, I agree, in, in a way, women are more emotional and more instinctive, yeah? Do you agree? Next thing. Other thing they said is women are less intelligent than men. Women are less intelligent than men. Now, what do you think about that? <laughs> well, I totally disagree with that. I don't know about you. <laughs> women are less intelligent than men. Who wrote this article? Men are stronger than women. Do you agree? Well, yeah, I mean, physically, men usually are stronger than women. Maybe emotionally and morally, we could debate the fact. Yeah, maybe. Okay. Next one. Men make better leaders than women. Do you agree with that? Yeah, up to a point. I mean, most of the leaders in this world are men. But maybe it's because women haven't had enough chance to be leaders yet. Who knows? All right. And the last one is a woman's place. A woman's real place is in the home. What do you think about that? Uh, I totally agree. A woman's place should be in the home. Nice article. Let's move to language. Maybe it's better. Let's talk about the language we use when we give opinions. And let's use the screen. So, asking for somebody's opinion, how can you do that? Well, you can say, what do you think about that? What do you think about that? Simple question. Or, what's your opinion? We can also ask, what do you feel about that, which is more related to emotions rather than to the intellect. So what do you feel about that? Or what are your thoughts? What are your views about that? All right, so those are all ways of asking for somebody's opinion. When you want to give your opinion, you can say, I think, I feel. In my opinion, we should. My view is that we should, my view, or as I see it, as I see it, I think we should. All right, so that's giving opinions. Now, often you want to talk about agreement. Now, 
How do you ask a person for agreement? We don't say, are you agree? Many languages translate that wrongly. It's not, are you agree, but do you agree with me? All right? Do you agree? Be careful. Do you agree? Another alternative is, do you go along? Go along means have the same opinion. Do you go along with that? All right? Now, imagine that you want to agree totally with someone. Do you agree with that? Exactly. You can say, I totally agree with you. I completely agree with you. You can say, yeah, I go along with that. I agree with that. You can also say, that's right. Exactly or absolutely. There's all ways of agreeing totally. Now, imagine that you agree sort of, you agree partially. The language here is, yeah, that's a good point, but I agree with you up to a point. I agree with you up to a point. So that's partial agreement, but not total agreement, all right? Now, disagreement, to be polite, uh, you can say, I can't agree with you, I'm afraid. If you say, I don't agree with you, that's quite aggressive. So it's better to say, I can't agree with you, I'm afraid, for example, if you're in a meeting. But if you want to be aggressive, you can say, I totally disagree with you. All right, so that's an aggressive disagreement. And you could also say, oh, come on, come on. All right, so there we looked at exchanging opinions, giving opinions, asking for opinions, and then talking about agreement, Agree agreeing totally, partially, and disagreeing. I'm sure you'll find that very useful because it's what we do every day. All right, so happy practicing and see you in the next lesson. Bye. Alice, mm. are you feeling okay? Oh, yeah. Hi, Anne. I'm just preparing a little lunch for Edouard. Edouard? Mm. What's with the French accent? I thought you said he was Canadian. He is, from the French part. His mother's French, so he's fully bilingual. Mm. Well, now that you mention it, I had noticed a slight... French accent. Oh, yes. Isn't it adorable? Mm. <sighs> <laughs> well, I must say, love does work wonders. I'm not at all used to seeing you as a, a housewife. Well, to tell you the truth, I haven't got used to it yet. <laughs> you know, I just hope I got the recipe right. You know, I followed the instructions to the letter. Mm. But you know I feel like a fish out of water with these things. Oh. So, um, you've decided to go for Edward's jugular? Well, not only that. Here's the crowning touch. What is it? It's a Chinese fortune cookie with a little note inside. <laughs> what a romantic idea. Do you think? I wrote the note myself. I, I thought I would surprise him by hiding it inside his napkin. Like this. What do you think? I think it's just perfect. <gasps> You'll see. It will go straight to his heart. Alice? Oh, 
It's already come in. What? Oh, in half an hour? Um, yeah, okay, okay. I'll, I'll be there in a few minutes. Anne, mm. could I borrow your car? Please. I have to go and pick up a packet my father sent me, but uh, the post office closes in half an hour and uh, I won't make it on foot. Um, my car? Mm. You don't have a licence? Oh, don't worry about it. I have it. And anyway, I always used to drive. You know, my dad's got a car just like yours. Okay, I'm off. <gasps> Tell Edward I'll be back in a flash. Mm. Used to it, Anne. It's the same old story. <sighs> now I'm late. <sighs> oh, I can't believe I always get myself into these situations. I'm late, and here I am helping Alice with her grand plan. I am. Oh, hello. Oh, that smells great. My compliments to the chef. Oh, <laughs> no, 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 Edward. It's not like you think. I have to go. I've got a meeting with my boss. Alice has just gone out. She told me to let you know that she'll be returning soon. Bye-bye. <laughs> well, I'm starving. Hmm, what's this? A little note? A little delight for the man who's got my heart raising. What? What's this all about? There must be some mistake. Oh, well, yes, this is my napkin. Who could have written this? Oh my God, Anne, but, but, but she was just here and she was so shy. This is getting interesting. Anne is very cute. So what am I going to do now? I'm not used to these things. Uh, now, has it gone? Well, it's not here. Mm. It's not there either. Edward? Yes? Have you seen my mobile phone? Uh, oh, no, here it is. Thanks. <laughs> Pardon me. Why are you eyeing me like that? Uh, no, nothing, nothing. Well, all right. I've got to run. Bye bye. <laughs> She's acting like nothing is happening at all. This is getting very interesting. Hello again and welcome back. Did you notice a grammatical form that they used? Used to and get used to. Did you pick that up when they were speaking? Because these are forms that we use in English when we're talking about habits. It's not an easy form and I'd like to teach you that now. And to do that, to give you an example of the grammar in action, I want to talk to you about when I moved to Italy and I lived there for some time and I had to change some of my habits. I had to adopt some Italian habits. I had to get used to new things, all right? So I'm going to use the grammar construction as I talk about this, try and listen and pick it up. Now, I wrote a list actually because really fascinating. You would think that Italy and England being very close wouldn't be very different, but in fact there are some noticeable differences. For example, driving on the right. I had to get used to driving on the right. In England we drive on the left, so you can imagine it's a question of life and death. So the first thing was 
I had to get used to driving on the right. You hear that? To get used to driving on the right. Now that means that I had to adopt a new habit to get used to doing something. We'll look at the um, grammatical form after. For now, just listen how I use it, all right? Another thing, oh yeah, Italian driving. I had to get used to Italian driving. Red lights are not really red lights. Red lights, traffic lights are negotiable. And I had to get used to being very flexible driving on the roads in Italy, I can assure you. <laughs> Now, oh, speaking Italian. Now, when you speak Italian, you divide the world into masculine and feminine. And you know that in the English language, we don't have masculine and feminine. For table is neutral, whereas in Italian, it can be masculine or feminine. Um, for example, a computer is masculine. So I had to get used to dividing my world into objects which are masculine and feminine, which for an English person is really quite a challenge. So another thing was rolling my R. In, in English, we don't say R. It doesn't exist. But in Italian, for example, if you want to say red, you have to say rosso. R. It took me one year to learn R. So I had to get used to rolling my R. Terrible. Coffee. In England, we have mugs of coffee like this. In Italy, I had to get used to small amounts of strong coffee. So that was a new habit. But then I found cappuccino, so that was the alternative. And the last thing that I had to get used to was the Italians gesticulating. The Italians use many gestures like, oh, and oh, and they, they use their shoulders, oh, and, and noises as well. And when I saw Italians in the street at the beginning, I thought they were always arguing. But in fact, they're not. It's a normal way for the Italians to gesticulate. So I had to get used to reading the language as not necessarily aggressive. All right, so that's some of the things I had to get used to, all right? Let's go and look at this grammatical form now because it's not easy to use, all right? Let's look at the screen. So to get used to is followed by the gerund form. And it describes this process of changing and taking on a new habit. Look at the examples. I'm getting used to speaking Italian every day. Used to speaking Italian. Now, we use the verb get, get used to, because it describes the process. And you can put the verb get into any tense, present tense, past tense, future, no problem. Here we have it in the present continuous. So, I'm getting used to speaking Italian every day. Listen to the pronunciation. I said used with a T sound. Used, not used or used. Used. That's very important to distinguish it from the other verb, use. Okay? Used. The next example, I still haven't got used to driving on the right. Here we have it in the present perfect. I haven't got used to driving on the right. Next example. Don't worry, you'll get used to it for the future. You'll get used to it. All right, so here we have an example in the future, used to it, which is an object. In the past, I had to get used to it. In the question form, how long did it take to get used to? Okay, how long did it take to get used to? So, a difficult form. Now, let's move on to the next uh, section, which is the verb to 
be used to. This is very interesting because when you change a habit, it's a process. But then when you have adopted the habit, it's a state. So we use the verb to be. The examples. I'm used to getting up early in the morning. That means that now I do it regularly with no problem. I am used. We use the verb to be for the state. He isn't negative used to working alone. In the past, I wasn't used to driving on the right. So here we have a state of a new habit using the verb to be. To get used to do something, something is adapting a new habit. It's the process. So that's a difficult grammatical form, but it's the only way in English that you can describe taking on new habits. So it's terribly important for you to learn. Don't worry, you'll get used to it slowly but surely. Okay, bye for now. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Let's Talk, our evening discussion program with our commentators Tom and Marie. Good evening everyone. Good evening. According to a recent report from the EU on the economies of the Eurozone, many companies are going through a difficult period. Senior managers are realizing that business as usual is no longer possible. Many companies need to embrace radical change in order to survive. What do you think about this situation? Well, uh, it's true that today companies must face up to the fact that they may have to change the way they do business. New technology is making this change necessary and new competition can result in a company having to completely rethink its business plan. I agree. Another example is when a company decides to enter a new market and becomes very successful. This success can require changes to the way the company does things. All these situations result in changes being needed to the way a company operates. Hmm. It's not easy to make changes to the way a company operates and the way people work. How can a company do this successfully? Well, there's been a lot of research on this topic. Uh, it's called the change management process. I see. So what are the elements of a successful change management process? Where do you start? Well, it's important to analyze the situation carefully before embarking on a process of change. A good analyst will identify the key areas of a company's operations that need to be changed. Mm. Uh, then an effective change strategy needs to be drawn up. This says exactly what needs to be changed. That's right. Input to the strategy can come from the management team or an external consultant. In addition, all the company's workers should be asked for ideas. Sorry, I don't quite follow that. Do you mean that the workers in a company should be able to decide what changes are made? No, that's not what I mean. Everyone in the company should be canvassed for suggestions on changes that could be made to the company. This enables employees to buy into the change process. They feel included and are more likely to implement the changes once they've been decided. Okay, I see. It's clear now. So, lots of people input into the change strategy. And what happens next? Well... Now the strategy has to be implemented. It has to be put into action. This can be the most difficult stage of the change management process. Staff need to be told about the changes and some may need training on new ways of doing things. A member of the management team should be available to answer questions from employees about the changes taking place. Hmm. And once the changes have been implemented, is that it? No, it's not. It's very important to consolidate the changes to make sure that employees don't go back to the old way of doing things. A manager should be chosen to act as a champion for the changes and should collect feedback from the employees to see what they think about the changes. This champion should praise employees who have implemented the changes. Of course, 
it's very important to raise the morale of staff at this time. Otherwise, there is a risk that they'll revert back to the old way of doing things. So it's quite a complex process. Well, companies need to know about change management techniques in order to survive in today's rapidly changing markets. Thanks to Tom and Marie for their explanation on how to bring about change in a company. Goodbye, Eric. Goodbye. And goodbye, everyone, and see you again next week for another edition of Let's Talk. So, the change management process is the process a company uses to change the way it operates. Due to new technologies and new competition, many companies have to rethink their business plan. To rethink something means to reconsider, to think again about a choice you made before. A business plan is a strategy for running a company. Remember, to run a company means to manage it. Companies have to embrace change. To embrace something means to accept it and put it into practice. So, to embrace change means to start making changes. Companies must face up to the fact that they have to change the way they do business. To face up to something means to accept a difficult situation exists. So, how does the change management process work? First, an analyst identifies the areas that need to be changed. An analyst is an expert who looks at all the elements of a situation. He analyzes a situation. Everyone in a company should be canvassed for suggestions. To canvas means to ask people for their opinions. This enables employees, the people who work in the company, to buy into the changes. To buy into something means to believe in something. Then a strategy is drawn up. The phrasal verb, to draw up, means to prepare. We use it for documents. For example, you draw up a contract. The strategy must then be implemented. To implement means to put into action. Once the strategy is implemented, it's important to consolidate it. To consolidate it means to make stronger. And employees should be asked for feedback to see what they think of the changes. Feedback means opinions about something. Well, folks, we've come to the end of today's program. See you again soon. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Talk Cinema. This morning, we'll be talking about the most famous of all science fiction sagas, Star Wars. As always, in the studio with me is Sanjeev Gupta, our cinema expert. Welcome, Sanjeev. Hello, Lucy. Hello, everyone. A question to start with, Sanjeev. Just how many films make up the Star Wars saga? Six in all. And how many of these have you seen? Ah, all six, of course. And you? Uh, four, I think. When was the first film made? The first film, A New Hope, was released in 1977. The last film, Revenge of the Sith, was released in 2005. And who's the director? Well, George Lucas wrote the scripts for all the films and directed four of them. And what about the other two? Irvin Kirshner is the director of The Empire Strikes Back and Richard Marquan directed The Return of the Jedi. What's so special about the Star Wars films, Sanjeev? Lots of things, actually, Lucy. You know, the first Star Wars film, back in 1977, broke new ground with its special effects. New methods were used whereby the action shots were taken against a blue background with real models. It doesn't sound sophisticated compared with today's computer-generated effects, but 29 years ago, it was revolutionary. In fact, the amount of time Lucas spent on the special effects almost resulted in the film not being finished. Why do you think the films have been so enormously popular? We're dealing with science fiction here, but really the storylines in the films draw on themes common not only to science fiction, but also to classical mythology. Really? Interesting. 
Yes, then there's the obvious struggle between good and bad. There's the famous force, the energy field that can be used for good but also for bad. Love plays a big part in the saga, as does the eternal struggle for power and domination. Love, power and domination, yes. So, have the films made a lot of money? It's been estimated that the films, along with the TV series, books and video games that have been made around the Star Wars theme, have generated $20 billion over the last 29 years. So, $20 billion, yes, that's rather a lot of money. And what about the music in the movies? I really love the music. Yes, I think the music has played an important role in helping people to remember the films. John Williams composed the scores for all six films. The style he uses has changed as the years have gone by. In the first films, he associated light motifs with each character. Quite a simple approach. In the later films, he changed his mind and took a richer, more sophisticated approach to the music. One last question. Is the saga definitely complete now? I wouldn't bet on it. There are rumours that George Lucas may be working on a sequel, but for television, not for the cinema. So, we may be seeing Luke Skywalker again soon. Wonderful. Well, thanks, Sanjeev, and goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> to all of you and Sanjeev, may the Force be with you. Goodbye. Now, let's have a look at some of that vocabulary we just used. So, six films make up the Star Wars saga. To make up something here means to go together to form the whole of something. The six films form the entire saga. To make up something is a phrasal verb that can also mean to invent something. For example, I made up a story means I invented a story. The first Star Wars film was released in 1977. We say a film is released when it can be seen at the cinema for the first time. It broke new ground with its special effects. To break new ground means to do something for the first time. It broke new ground because it was the first film to shoot the action shots with real models. An action shot is a scene of a film with action. For example, a car chase or a battle. And what are special effects? They're visual effects added to a film after the shooting has been completed. The shooting is the filming process of a film. The special effects used in the first Star Wars films were not very sophisticated compared with the computer-generated effects of today's films. Computer-generated effects are special effects that are made using a computer. The soundtracks of the Star Wars films have also become very famous. The soundtrack of a film is its music. In the first films, John Williams, the composer of the soundtracks, associated light motifs with each character. A light motif is a reoccurring musical or visual theme associated with a particular character, situation or emotion. Well, we have, as usual, run out of time. So, goodbye for now. <laughs>